All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Tune In The Podcast. We are the Southern Hemisphere's best and only dedicated Newcastle United podcast out there. Today, we are going to be uh, reviewing the amazing win down on the South Coast against Southampton at uh, St Mary's Stadium. We will also be touching on the Midweek Cup game against Palace. And with me to go through those, I have Dimi and Bobby with me. How are you doing, boys? Shout out. Good night. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it's was. been a long day for everyone here in Australia, so uh, I'm on the east coast of Queensland. The game finished for me probably, what, maybe two o'clock, something like that. Stayed up to see the team photo uh, about 2.30. Uh, I know you commented on that as well, Dimmy, because you was there, uh, maybe 2.30 for you, but it's 3.30 for me. Um, yeah. and then you had a, another game straight after that one, I believe, is that right? I did. I had the... Uh... The Super Classico in Greece, which was started at 4.30 Melbourne time. So I was drifting in and out of that game and probably probably got a good solid two hours sleep. But uh, definitely worth it when uh, Newcastle get the win and then uh, my Greek team gets a 97th minute equaliser. So that's always, uh, always good. And how are you, Bobby? Yeah, same as Timmy. Uh, I think I went to bed around about 4 a.m. and then... Um... Got up at six o'clock in the morning because I had to drive to do a presentation to 30 people. Um, I don't know how well I did, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> so I'm shattered. I, as, as you guys know, I had a 20 minute kip on the couch just before the podcast, and that's probably made me feel worse. But anyway, we'll, we'll battle on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a long day, but it was absolutely worth it to see the tune smash fall past Southampton again. And uh, for anybody that is uh, watching, uh, just before we dive straight into uh, this podcast, please give us a, a thumbs up on YouTube when you're watching this video. It helps us out massively as well. Give us a subscribe if you haven't already too. And we've just launched our new membership program where you can help us out massively by becoming one of our members from as little as $1.49 a month here in Australia or only just 85 pay a month back in the UK. If you want to do that, just hit the join button. You will see that on our YouTube homepage. And if you're listening on any of the podcast audio sites, please give us a five-star review. Again, that helps us out massively. Um, so now we're going to dive straight into this. Now, the kickoff time itself was 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon in the UK, which was midnight for me and 1 a.m. for both uh, Bobby and Dimmy there. Jumping straight into lineups, we're going to go into the Newcastle one just because obviously that's our team straight away. And I'll start with you first, Dimi. I'll read through the, the lineup and see what you think of the, those actual uh, starting 11. So in goal, as uh, per usual, Nick Pope. Then we've got Trippier, Shaw, Botman, and Byrne making up the back four, which is uh, very familiar. In the middle, we've got Bruno, Longstaff, Willock, then Amaron, Murphy, and Wilson making up the front three, effectively. And on the bench, we've got a, a long awaited return for Carl Darlow. But your best friend, Jamal LaSalle, is in there, Dimi. Uh, return of Shelby back to the squad, St. Maximum back in the squad. Targets there, Mankio, Wood, Fraser and Anderson make up the rest of the bench. From what was available to us at our disposal, disposal uh, with Joe Linton being suspended, is that the starting 11 you would have went for? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I don't reckon St. Maximum's probably ready to start. He's been in and out with his hamstring injury the last couple of months. So I think the way that Murphy was playing before he was rested or, or dropped the other week. I think he probably deserved the first the first goal at the starting eleven position. And especially the way the way we play and the way we press, Murphy probably suits that a lot obviously a lot better than Maxi. And until Maxi is one hundred percent fit, there's no need to, to rush him back. We're scoring goals, we're creating chances. It's not like we're a one man team these days. So yeah, but besides that potential um, change there with Maxi and Murphy, I think it was uh, business as usual for the rest of the team. Anybody you would have switched out in that starting eleven, Bobby? Uh, no, I will. I'm surprised that there's not been as much rotation as I think we touched on it in the last pod, uh, the last uh, review pod as well about how our press and everything um, is high intensity, and there's not been much rotation in the squad. But if we were going to start a team, this is exactly as I predicted it. Um, I thought Murphy would come in for Jolinton and. Uh, don't upset the apple cart too much. So, yeah, it wasn't no surprises for me. Yeah, it was a very strong 11. And again, I agree with both. I think it's the best one you could possibly put out. I did shout out for Maxi to start when I heard some of their uh, left backs and right backs were potentially injured. But 
Uh, obviously, Eddie knows best. So I'm not going to argue with uh, what that man knows because his knowledge of the game is significantly better than mine, that's for sure. Uh, so we're going to jump into the Southampton lineup now. Um, again, I'll just read those out. So in goal, we've got Bazunu, uh, Larios. Uh, is that a bottle of ketchup for number 37? <laughs> uh, Salasu, Perro, Maitland Niles, Ward Prowse is the captain, Stuart Armstrong and Elianusi, Walcott. And Shea Adams leading up front on the bench. Uh, we have McCarthy, Caleta Carr, Lianco, Levia, Diallo, Aribo, Edozi, Mara, and old Jody Boy, Adam Armstrong there. But here's a question for you, lads. As you can see on that picture there, there is a picture of a pigeon next to the subs bench. Anyone know why there was a pigeon there? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, Craig, it's got to do with their game against Arsenal where... Um, Ramsdale was distracted by a pigeon and um, they scored. So I think it's a, an in joke. He had to be there with Southampton, but um, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Well, that's a cracking bit of a banner in Shahawasri on uh, Southampton's part. So well done on those there. Uh, when this lineup was announced, I went straight on to uh, Southampton's Twitter page, and there was a lot of people having a little bit of a displeasure at the fact that Walcott was starting. Uh, he's, I don't know how old he is now, but he's been around since the dawn of time, effectively. And obviously started his uh, career with Southampton, so he's well-loved by the fans there. But besides Walcott and his prolific score and tally against us with Arsenal, is there anybody else in that squad that you thought, hold on, we could be in a little bit of uh, trouble here as the game goes on? I'll go with you first, Bobby, on that one. Um. Uh, look, no, I mean, they're an unpredictable team, Southampton. They they drew with Arsenal, um, so they, they've got a performance in there and they've, they've got some, you know, pretty good players in Ward-Prowse um, and, and the like. So no one really, you know, we, we're sort of battling and beating Tottenham and Man United and all those sort of t um, clubs and stuff like that. So um, no one really worried me, but, it, you know, and as the game proved, I think they played pretty well, Southampton, so... Um, yeah, no, no one really worried me though, mate. And you, Demi? Yeah, prob probably not. But like Bobby said, they're very unpredictable. They've they've got a nine 0 loss in them, but they've also got a a one all draw against Arsenal or a or a surprise result in them as well. So they're very unpredictable. So obviously, Ward Prowse is is the one you worry about when there's a set piece. His set piece delivery is superb and can smash them in from any angle. So he's always the one that you worry when when you play Southampton, but. Uh, but yeah, besides him, I thought um, we should have them pretty much matched up and covered across the park. Yeah, I thought player for player, man and man, I think we had probably the stronger squad over the 11 by a fair amount, to be honest. So I don't think there's anything there that would uh, really trouble us. But a lot of people are talking about, uh, on the Southampton side of things, Adozi being able to make an impact if he started. He did come on later on the game and showed a few flashes of brilliance, but Though he was the one that everyone wanted to start over Walcott. I don't know what the beef is with him. Maybe he's just a little bit too old now uh, over the hill and it's not the player he once was. Um, but moving into the game, the game itself, I thought it kind of started very similar to the Aston Villa game last week, where, if anything, uh, Southampton, they were on the front foot from the first whistle. Uh, they had a, a few early chances where Perot had a, a low shot, uh, which... Uh, Nick Pope saved down onto his left, which was a good attempt by them, to be honest. And Perot was a bit of a constant thorn in the side, one of their better players throughout the game. But those opening 10, 15 minutes or so, did you expect the game to start that way, Timmy? Or were you expecting us to go all guns blazing and just try and go for the juggler from the, the first whistle? Yeah, it's interesting. With, with our performances of late, we haven't really blown teams away in the first 20 minutes. I mean, we've, we've made our, we've made our stamp and we've, we've started the games usually on the front foot, but sometimes it takes us a little while to, to break teams down. Like we saw against Villa, we didn't score till the 50th minute or whatever it was in, in stoppage time in the first half. Then we completely annihilated them in the second half. So I definitely thought we had to gr grind it out early and, and, and match them, match their intensity and match their, their bottle, which I thought we pretty much did. But, but yeah, definitely the game was a bit scrappy initially from our perspective and didn't look as fluent as we probably would have hoped. Um, got a question for yourself, your Bobby, as well. Is Do you think for the first opening 10 minutes or so, we kind of invite 
pressure onto ourselves just so the teams may get a, a false sense of what they could achieve throughout the game and they we can we can't attack them they are here for the taken which then leaves them vulnerable to the counter attack which they definitely was as the game grew on i don't know if it's that that we invite the pressure um for those reasons but i think you know especially those first 10 or so minutes it's all a tactical game you know um you're sort of discovering how they're going to play how they're matching up so you're sort of getting your systems right and where to go. And even for the players, they're finding out, you know, what space they need to you know, stand in and all that sort of thing. So I think always the first 10, 15 minutes is a bit of a feeling out process. And if you score in those, that time, then you've really got the impetus to, to push on a little bit more. But, you know, there's not really a bad team in the Premier League and we're playing away from home. So, you know, I think um, those first 10, 15 minutes was a typical away sort of performance and setting up for, you know, what we did. And I think just on that, I think um, what Dimmy said, we will back our fitness over anyone else. And I think that's yeah. what we do. We, we do grind a little bit in the first half um, and then expect that our fitness will just overrun teams, which it has done lately anyway. But with Big Joe being suspended and Murphy taking his place on the left, did he ever feel that we may be going to be a little bit exposed in terms of defensive capability on the left-hand side? I didn't think so. I thought Murphy probably gives us a bit more cover than than Maxi would. And obviously, Joe Linton works superbly back and, and, and forward and holds the ball up well. If anything, probably in possession, lacked a little bit on, on that side. Murphy's obviously not as, not as good as shielding the ball and, and carrying the ball forward. He's probably got that one move where he does a step over and pushes it past the fullback and has a run, which is the standard winger move. But in terms of defensively, I thought we'd, we'd be fine. It was more how we'd be able to carry the ball forward and, and whether Murphy would be able to provide that same quality that, that uh, Big Joe does. Now, were either of you, uh, again, I'll go to you first on this one, Bobby. Were either of you surprised to see Willock actually spending more time on that left-hand side than what Murphy did? Murphy tend to step inside a little uh, during those initial 20 minutes or so. Yeah, a little bit. Like, I mean, again, what you said earlier about how in his brain and how it all operates, I wouldn't know. He's just a smart man. So there was obviously a reason for it. And I thought Willock was absolutely superb. So yeah. um, he obviously saw something there. So, you know, I, I, am I surprised? Well, I get surprised at all the tactics, really, because, you know, you don't sort of see what they're seeing. But, um, yeah, I thought it was, you know, a great move again by by Sir Eddie. Sir Eddie. Uh, I think he's got to get the keys to the city soon, that's for sure. At least you'd hope so. He certainly deserves them on that one. Uh, and moving on to the first goal. Uh, this came on 35 minutes. And I think we could have all guessed who got this first goal, couldn't we? Uh, the form he's been on lately. Uh, Will Miggy, uh, the man in form, the future Ballon d'Or winner, goal of the month winner for October, player of the month for October. And who knows, he might even get the Puskas award. Uh, he's just going to literally walk away with every competition that he can possibly get. And the form he was in in October, he's obviously started November in a bang. The play and the build-up to that goal, I don't think it's, he's given as much credit for the goal as he should have been. Because from what I, the angle that I've seen, just as the defender's about to come in to make the tackle, he does a little drag back to protect the ball to then move out, and then he puts it into the bottom corner. The composure and confidence running through this lad's veins right now, compared to Miggy that was around last season, is night and day. It is absolutely unreal. What do you think is the, the number one cause of Miggy's step up in form, Dimmy? And how long do you think it can continue? Well, obviously, the, the biggest thing is confidence. But but the confidence you have to get from your manager and, and from your teammates to, to be able to express yourself and, and do what you can do. I mean, playing at this level in, in the Premier League, all these guys are, are top players and have had great careers and, and obviously are good enough skill-wise and and ability-wise to, to make an impact. But you need to have sometimes that that manager to put put the arm around you, give you the confidence, give you the specific tasks that you need to do. And he's he's just absolutely out of this world, like you said, Craig. I mean, like like, like you mentioned, with that, with that goal, his composure at the end when 
I think it was Maitland Niles slipped through or he would try to try to block and just the yeah. composure just to wait that half a second just to let Maitland Niles slide through and and make the finish look so comfortable. I mean, there's no way in hell he makes he scores that goal last year. He'd either snap the shot where the ball gets blocked or he'd drag it back or he'd he'd turn backwards. He didn't wouldn't know what to do with the penalty box, but but now when you see Miggy one on one with a goalkeeper, you're thinking, Oh, this is a goal, this is shelling peace for him. This guy scores a banger every week. So one on one is uh shelling peace. In the, the build-up to the goal as well, Bobby, uh, we had Sean Longstaff, we had Callum Wilson, the whole team just plugging it together and just laying it through to Mickey. When he first received that ball, did you think there's going to be a goal here? Or you thinking, oh, no, it's Miggy, you know, he could potentially stuff it up. But again, that's Miggy of old. This current Miggy, were you thinking, oh, he's just going to take a shot from 35 yards and put it in the top ins, or he's going to dribble around three people and put it in the bottom corner? Because we we don't know what we're going to expect from Miggy, apart from that it is going to end on the back of the net. And the, the, like I mentioned before, the confidence that he's got, is it surprising you even more week by week by how much better he is and how much better he's getting as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course it is. I mean, like... Uh, what, I don't think there'll be anyone who wouldn't be surprised with what's happened with Miggy. And, you know, we saw it with Joel Litton last year, but this is even more, you know, this is, you know, he's turned into to Messi, you know, the way he plays. He's just, he's phenomenal. Like, and, you know, on to your point, once he was one-on-one and got past Maitland-Niles, I, I I knew it was a goal. I knew it was going near the back of the net was going to ripple because that's just the kind of form he's in and he's just turned into this player. But, there's two things I want to say. He started that move from out, you know, from the centre of the pitch. He got the ball and passed it and all that. I just want to touch on Callum Wilson's touch to get it back to him as well. Um, that hasn't been commented on, but I, he definitely meant it. And um, it opened up. And I'm glad you said that Miggy's drag back was there because the commentators were saying, oh, you know, he got lucky with the, the slide and all that, but I saw it too. So, uh, you know world-class goal by a world-class player. And I think if you stop the season now, he is being nominated for the Ballon d'Or. But I think yes. there's no doubt about it, which is, you know, <laughs> bloody hell. You, you'd have to slap me, to, you know, last year. I'd, I'd laugh in your face if you told me this was happening. Uh, any of the players to be nominated for uh, Ballon d'Or, obviously he's not going to get nominated, but you never know. No, no, no. Um, but any of the players to be even in contention for it, the last person to probably put on that would be Miggy. So massive uh, congratulations on the turnaround and form. And if you want to know a little bit about uh, Miggy, we just done an interview with uh, Roberto Rojas. Uh, you'll be able to see that on our YouTube timeline or again, just do a search for it on uh, your podcast channels. A uh, bit of an in-depth insight into what makes Miggy tick and a few unknown things that you might not have heard about him before. So give that a watch and give that a listen when you get the chance. And so, just before everyone goes at me, no, I don't think he's going to win the Ballon d'Or. I don't think he's going to get nominated. I'm just saying the the kind of form he's in, like it's it's incredible. So, yeah, fair play to the lad. Uh, yeah, I don't think he's going to get nominated, but you know he's definitely going to be in uh, probably Premier League team of the season, which at the moment would be one hell of an accolade, and he wouldn't be far off that to be honest. Um, he's definitely in the first half, that's for sure. Um, but Grealish just before the end Grealish. of the second Grealish. half, sorry, mate. Is what? Grealish the water boy? Uh, Grealish isn't even in the stadium, mate. He's an armchair supporter, sitting back, flicking through the channels, uh, eating cheesy watsits, and waiting for the adverts to come on so he can cry listening to Coldplay. Uh, <laughs> that's basically what's going to happen with him. But uh, <laughs> just before halftime, uh, Southampton had a golden chance to get back into the game with a uh, good bit of work down our left-hand side. Uh, left uh, burn for dead, which, again, he's got to expose once or twice in this game. Managed to get a fantastic cross in. Trippier is in no man's land. Nothing you could really do about it. But Elianusi somehow manages to put it high and wide from an open goal. If that goes in, that's a game-changer because it's smack bang on half-time pretty much. Uh, but luckily... Uh, they weren't clinical. They obviously left their shooting boots in the changing rooms. If that goal had went in, Eddie's team talk at half time, I'd imagine, would have been significantly different. And how much of an impact do you think that had on their second half coming out uh, in preparation for the second forty-five? Demi. Well, in in the end, they they started probably the better of the team in the second half as well. So. I'm not sure how much of an impact it had in terms of the the start to the second half, but obviously 
goals change games. So scoring right before, before half time would have changed the game. And and like you said, yeah, I, when when the cross came in, I was expecting the net to, to ripple. It was a wonderful cross by I think it was Armstrong and completely took Trippy out of the game. There was there was no way Pope was stopping it if it was on target. So no. yeah, like lucky for us, the he's fluffed his lines and he and he's missed. But but sometimes you get that better luck. I mean, we had a chance. I think five minutes before that where. It was good work down the left. I think it was from from Willick and Longstaff had a diving header from about six yards that he put over. So we also had a chance to, to go further ahead. And, and these things happen in football. You, you miss chances. You, you hit the post. That's what happens. And we got our luck uh, before half time. And the half time score being one nil, Bobby. Do you think that was justified? Um, I think so. I think after the, I think they showed in the first fifteen minutes. Um, then I think from fifteen to. The most of the rest of that that half, I think we we were much better. Um, as Dibby said, they'll come out at half time, and I thought they were the better second half team for a long period. But um, I think we controlled that first half, and I was pretty, you know, satisfied with one nil. As the second half went on, you're absolutely right. Southampton did start uh, the game of the second half the strongest, and that another fantastic chance as well with a ball from the right hand side this time. Crossed over to Chi Adams, who had a, a shot on the volley. Uh, it was so close, but he did uh, drag it wide. If anything, I thought it was going to bounce in off um, Botman's shins, to be honest, in another own goal, uh, just like it was uh, last season. But when your look is going against you, your look is going against you. Any other game, chances are that would hit the post, bottom corner, flew in, whatever. But it must have been at that point, Newcastle thought, how are we, lads? Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's go get the second goal. And as the rain poured down, and the rain did pour down, uh, and as we know, the heavier the rain gets, the less clothes we wear. Swing the shirts around and everything in the stands. It was absolutely glorious. And on what I believe was, what was it we're looking at? Uh, 58 minutes. So we absorbed about 10, 12 minutes worth of pressure. And we didn't really create much in the second half. But there's no bad time to score a goal. But Chris Wood's goal couldn't have come at a better time possible, Bobby. And what did you make of Chris Wood's goal? Oh, it was superb. I think all four goals were high-quality goals by high-quality high quality team. But that one was, a, you know, a very good striker's goal. You know, the turn and the finish in the, you know, the bottom corner um, gave the keeper no chance. So that was good. It was good to see. Um, Chris Wood's a bit of a forgotten um, figure for us. And... You know him to show that he still got you know can come off the bench and and contribute a little bit that uh you know it's good it's good to see but that, that was a quality finish by him and much needed as you said like i was a bit nervous at that time i thought uh oh, they're probably gonna um you know equalize here i thought they were the stronger team so yeah that goal changed the whole game again and then what four minutes later we have probably one of the best in form defenders in the league, maybe in European football right now, in Kieran Trippier, who manages to get on the end of, I think it was a loose ball, that was just uh, about a break on the halfway line. He manages to beat the defender to it. In the inch-perfect pass to Willick couldn't have been any better in Willick's run. And I actually thought uh, Willick fluffed his shot to begin it to begin with, because there was just no power in it whatsoever. But that was an inch-perfect shot as well. And to go from 1-0 up to scoring a two goals within four minutes, put the game to bed, and nobody deserves a goal more this season than Joe Willock, because his effort over the last 10 games or so has been phenomenal. We all know Callum Wilson's school, stories go to Fulham, and he took him out for dinner to uh, say sorry on that one. But thoroughly deserved on that one. That goal was absolutely fantastic. The break in speed that we've done from Trippier to the ball hitting the back of the net, that's world-class attack in football, would you agree to me? Absolutely. It, it reminded me of the goal we scored against Villa last week. I think it was Joe Linton's the third one where we charged we charged out of defence. We had three or four guys driving. The ball was played in behind the defence and they ended up with Wilson's shot blocked to, to Joe Linton to score. It was, it was a beautiful goal. I mean, for, for your right back to be able to intercept the ball and play an inch perfect through ball like that, it's it's a luxury that we haven't probably ever had, to be honest. And we're we're blessed every week to see Trippier play, and he's well and truly entitled to wear that captain's armband every week because he's been superb for us. But but yeah, like you said, Wilk deserves his goal. He's been sensational. He's 
his leg power and his, his driving with the ball is very underrated in this team. I mean, he does frustrate you sometimes. He's not as adept on the ball as as you'd probably hope for a for a midfielder in that in that midfield three. But his driving runs are, are very important. And and the goal, yeah, it, look, it looked a bit scruffy, but in those conditions, it was a very wet pitch. A, a toe poke from that close is all you need. And then you got, you got the accuracy, and uh, it was uh, it was three 0 With balls uh, like that, Bobby. You're going to carve up the best defences in the world, I'd imagine you could say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, it was superb. It just threaded the line in that weather, in those conditions as well. Like to have the weight on the pass to be that perfect is, you know, Kieran Trippier is a world class player. We're seeing it every week. So, you know, it was no surprise, but it was just a wonderful piece of play. But before that, Gimaris was, um, Bruno was superb as well, I thought, in holding off and, um, I think he got the ball out to Trippier. I don't know if it was a scuffed kick, but he saw him there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that through ball by Trippier was, you know, I think you mentioned something on Twitter about Pornhub, Craig. You don't need, you don't need Pornhub. I'll just replay that. <laughs> yeah, you don't need Pornhub when you've got NUFC, and it's so true. Because when that third goal went in, I was standing to attention, that's for sure. I think uh, everyone uh, wearing a black and white shirt was, because that goal was pure sexual. Uh, genuinely was it was always oh, fantastic and that goal pretty much sealed the game to be honest i think everyone knew three points was in the bag uh we started making some changes maxi came on uh and so did anderson he got a uh, about 20 minutes uh on his birthday his 20th birthday so uh happy birthday to him and also man Kyo, who to be honest a few weeks ago we didn't even know if he was still alive uh he just uh, appeared from nowhere and now he's back playing football and he showed rusty signs um there was a few loose passes between him and anderson they obviously haven't had much time together on the pitch so the understanding is not really going to be there but it's good to know we've got cover for when we need to. When we, we, we've seen games out, we know we've got the three points. But we did then concede a very, very sloppy goal in how it looked like. I think Anderson was playing right back um, when I would have thought Mankio would have slotted there. But Mankio was on the, the left-hand side for some reason. And he tries to head the ball before it goes in. The composure from Peru, again, he's one that had a few shots in the first half, to put Shaw on his arse, send him for a hot dog, and then bring it back in, and then place it in that top corner past Pope. When you three one down, confidence can be low, but his confidence was quite high, uh, and it must have been to have a finish like that. Did he have you start get a little bit twitchy when that first goal went in, thinking there could be a comeback on here, or were you more than confident we had enough to see it out? Bobby, I'll let you go first. Oh, yeah, no. Nah. It was a, to be honest, it was probably a goal they deserved. Um, you know, so. But I didn't feel threatened at all that they were going to come back. I thought, you know, the game had gone. And, you know, that, that guy who scored the goal, Peru, whatever his name is, he's he was quality, actually. I, I didn't mind the look of him. So, no, look, I, I, my personal thing is I think, you know, I hate conceding a goal, especially with our defensive record. And if you watch it back, Botman was absolutely filthy. Um, Livid. Lost his, Livid. Lost his shit. He was raging on Which is what you want to see. You know, we don't want to concede any time. But... Um, I think they deserved a goal, and I think, um, you know, we weren't threatened anyway, so, yeah, it was all good. Yeah, so the goal for them came on the 88th minute, so again, game was pretty much uh, dead in the water. Maybe teams, uh, or Newcastle teams of old would have folded under the pressure, but we kept strong, and in fact, we added to that goal with another sublime finish from Bruno. Uh, that goal came in the 91st minute with a neat little one-two with Maxi, uh, on the, what, maybe 20, 25 yards out, I would say it was. Uh, you give it a Maxi. Maxi had the ball up, played it two, and then Bruno just takes one quick step to the right, bends it around the defender and puts it in the bottom right-hand corner. Kiba stood absolutely no chance. And I don't know if you've both seen this, but on the replay, when you're watching it from like a, a pitch level side, you can see the ref just looking around the uh, defender, uh, watching the ball go in the corner, thinking, you know what, this bloke's quality. Mm. Bruno, he scored against Southampton last season in his uh, first full start, I believe it was, Russ, with that donkey kick or whatever you want to call it. Was this goal better than his donkey kick, Mitch? I know first. No, it, yeah. was, it, was, it wasn't better. But, I mean, he just showed how good he was. It, it looked, Even though it was a quality finish, he made it look so easy. He, he literally just curl, curled it, bounced it in from 20, 20 yards and 
made it look like shelling peas again. I mean, I mean we, we brought up Messi before. I mean, that was that's a Leo Messi type finish. He doesn't Messi sometimes doesn't score the the top corner goals. He picks his spot bottom corner and, and makes it look easy. And I mean, when you got the luxury of a player like Bruno, who was supposed to be a, a defensive um, midfielder for us, to 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 bomb on with Maxi and in the ninety first minute, like you said, the game's done. But to have the quality of just picking a spot like that, it's it's a, an absolute luxury and. And just just like we're saying with Trippier, it's a it's a pleasure to watch these boys week in week out. Do you think uh, his donkey kick was better than this goal, Bobby? Yeah, definitely. The donkey kick was one of the best things I've ever seen. Like it was just <laughs> the thinking to do that and to execute it was just like you, I knew then he was a special player. Like you just had that, you know, as soon as he did it. But you know, I read something on Twitter that that he heard Eddie shout, "Put it in the corner." Um, when he got the ball, so he did, but Eddie actually <laughs> meant take it to the corner. Um, <laughs> lost in translation there, <laughs> lost in translation there, I think. But, um, yeah, quality finish like that was special. Like, it is, I don't think it's as good as the donkey one, but my god, it was good. See, I still think there's a bit of luck with that donkey kick. I think he just meant to make contact, I don't think he meant to get it on target in the roof of the net above Fraser Foster. I do think there was an air of luck with that one, whereas this, he obviously meant it from the second he thought about taking the shot. But, you know, uh, we'll uh, agree to disagree on that one. And that pretty much uh, brought the, the game to an end. And I'm just going to bring up some stats regardless, because that was our third away win of the Premier League season, along with Fulham and Spurs. Now, Fulham, we also scored four past those. We did concede again, so there's another 4-1 win. Spurs, an amazing win. Uh, their first loss of the, the season. Looks as though we've um, destroyed Spurs now because they got beat off Liverpool as well, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. So we leapfrogged them above the table, which is shown just a few moments. We've taken 12 points on the road from a maximum of 21 so far this season already. That is a fantastic turnaround for where we were. Three wins, three draws in that one loss at Anfield, which I know we're all still butthurt about that one. But it's not the fact that we're, we're getting points. We're also scoring goals away from home. We're not just sneaking one nils or anything. Like that. We've scored 12 and conceded six on the road too. Scoring 12 goals uh, away from home is absolutely fantastic and the one thing that i think this is leading to this as well is we're actually getting different goal scorers we've actually had 12 different goal scorers in the league so far this season already 13 if you count the sales goal in there the league cup against tramia so i'll just go through the list of goal scorers so we've got shaw wilson miggy trippier asm isak longstaff bruno murphy joe linton wood and willock 12 players already, and we are, what, 14 games in in the season? And I can't remember the last time we had such strength and depth of goal scorers. Are either of you surprised by how many players have scored so far this season already, knowing that now? Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, the sign of a good team is to spread the load and not rely on, on one player. And, I mean, for how many for how many years we worried when Wilson was out, we thought, Oh, we're rooted here. We can't score goals. We can't. Maxi's out. Oh, we can't create chances. But Maxi hasn't played for a month and a half. Wilson's been in and out, and we're we're scoring four goals routinely on the road now. It's it's chalk and cheese for where we've come from. But it's a sign of a good team, Craig. I think when you say we've got twelve points from from twenty one, uh, twelve from twenty one, at away from home. Obviously, when you're battling relegation like we were for so long, and you focus on your home games, you focus on getting your results at home, and that should keep you up, but the top six teams and, and the good teams focus on getting results away from home, and that's that's sometimes the the difference between finishing fourth or finishing seventh. So, getting the results out as we are away from home is going to be very important, I think, in the long run. And and like you said, it's a it's a sign of a good team, and uh, long may continue. Yeah, your thoughts on that one, Bobby? Yeah, it's the Eddie Howe effect, isn't it? You know, he's just made us you know an unbelievable team, and um. All those, a lot of those plays you mentioned were pre-takeover as well, and yeah. all of a sudden they become really good players. So um, it's just good coaching. It's something you were not used to, um, <laughs> not since, you know, Sir Bobby, and then before that, Keegan, of course. But we're not really used to this level 
of intricate coaching and making players better. And, you know, uh, read, a, read a little thing with Eddie saying that he'll never take a player's talent for granted. Um, like we, we say, you can't get to the Premier League level if you haven't got, you know, if you haven't got talent. So um, he just focuses on what the players are good at and he'll bring it out of them. So, you know, we're in dreamland at the moment. We've got the perfect manager as well steering the ship. So, yeah, awesome. And it's absolutely a marriage made in heaven with Newcastle and Eddie Howe right now. And long may continue. He's, he's not a Geordie. I don't understand. Don't the London press say that we don't... Oh, yeah, we're supposed watch. to hear yeah. it, aren't we? Yeah. If uh, anybody north of the Watford Gap, apparently we are uh, south of the Watford Gap, we are supposed to absolutely detest. But, you know, yeah. don't worry about that. We'll, uh, we'll let talk shite and whatever they want to spout regarding anything that they do. But you got to also remember this takeover was deader than a dead thing from Deadland. So and look where we are now. So happy days to everybody. <laughs> Just going to show up uh, the full-time stats now. So... Southampton had the majority of possession, uh, which is quite interesting. We did have a slight edge at half time. We were 51 of their 50, but they edged the full time possession at 55%. They had 16 shots to our seven, five of which were on target for them. We had four, and we scored from all four of those. And to me, that just shows clinical. Uh, and it shows the training that we're doing is paying off big time. They had eight corners to our two, and when you've got someone like James Ward-Prowse taking those corners, you'd think that they would get close with one or two, but they didn't really trouble our defence at all from any set pieces or corners on that one. Fouls, seven to ten, and there's one yellow card in the game, which went to Levy, I think it was, uh, sometime in the second half on that one. Any of those stats surprise uh, you, Bobby? Um, yeah, look, it's the first time in a long time we haven't led on possession and shots. So, um, pretty much going back to what I said before, I think when Southampton scored, I wasn't too disheartened because I actually thought they, they did deserve one. Um, and yeah, so, but what it tells me is we can play and adapt to different styles as well. You know, this was a, a grind and we needed to show our quality when we had our opportunities, which we did. So good teams, as Dimmy said can do this they pick up points and maximum points you know when they're not playing to their level like and we did, we were, weren't at our absolute brilliant best for this game but we still came away with a 4-1 win away from home so you know you can't complain and uh i'll throw it over to you know demi which of those stats surprises you the most and do you see southampton getting out of trouble if they can play like that week in week out on the first point, I think probably the possession, like Bobby said, surprised us. I think maybe that was caveated by the the weather was absolutely shitting down, so I'm not sure the pitch was in the best condition. It, I mean, Bruno was slipping over, Botman was misplacing passes here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. It looked like a very tough pitch to 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 pass the ball on. So I think we probably made a calculated decision, mm. decision to say, look, maybe we're not going to play our free flowing football as much as we can. We did in the first half; the combinations were quite good, but as the rain started shitting down, we probably thought, okay, let's let's maybe try and play a bit more on the break and, and use our pace. And obviously we did Willick on the break and, and we scored those goals in the second half. So probably the possession was, was the one. And in terms of the Saints, whether they'll get out of trouble, well, now they've got uh, ex mom victory legend and uh, potential in interim charge, Richard Keech Bigler. So uh, hopefully uh, he can get them a few results before they find a, a full-time boss. But, but no, I think they've got enough quality to stay up. I think there's... There's worse teams in the league, and um, now that the Sook, Ralph, who's in Hotel or whatever his name is, is uh, long gone, then um, maybe they'll uh, they'll turn them turn their season around. Now, it's not actually confirmed that Hassel Falsch has been sacked yet, has it? Or it's something that is going to happen. I just don't know whether it has actually happened yet. Uh, is time of actual recording anyway. By the time this goes out within the next hour or so, it's never changing landscape in football, so who knows what happens between now and then. But as of time of recording, I do believe he is still the manager of Southampton. Are you? Is that something you're both aware of still, Bobby? Um, I think so. I, just before coming on air, I think there was a, a tweet by a, a journal that's pretty good. Um, he's pretty spot on, and he said that he's gone and so they've already got a replacement lined up. So who knows? Like, as you say, it's ever, ever moving. It could be come out that it's not true. So, um, 
he's a sook though, and he's a negative person. And I think they have quality and they've got good attacking prowess, but he's just so negative in the way he plays and also his attitude and the way he comes out in the media. I think it discourages them. So I see this change as being a positive one for them. Um, and I like Demi. I think they'll have too much to go down. I think they they've got some quality, so that I think they'll stay up if they get the appointment right. You know, they could hire Steve Bruce, so <laughs> who knows? <laughs> or Stevie G, <laughs> just modern day version of. But uh, I'll tell you one thing as well. When I seen uh, Hasselfort standing there on the touchline in his jacket, he had his hood up, was pissing down with the rain. He did just look like someone had all ordered a Jurgen Klopp off Wish. Uh, he just looked like a shit version of. And the excuses he comes out with, again, just out the pages of Klopp, he's just a poor man's version of. If he had half the tactical now as he did, he'd probably be uh, working in the, with the Champions League club right now. But yeah, chances are he will be gone maybe within the next few hours, 24 hours, who knows. Um, but now what we're going to do is bring up the league table. Now, uh, boys, are you ready for this? Get ready. We are in third. Yes! Look at that. I mean, if that doesn't get you excited, I mean, for those that are listening, I'm just going to break down the, the top six. So you've got Arsenal, who went back to top spot with their win against uh, Chelsea at Sanford Bridge, 1-0. Uh, Man City, they just beat Fulham, I believe it was. Yeah, with a 92nd minute uh, Erlen Haaland penalty. Uh, we obviously beat... Um, Southampton 4-1, uh, hence the what we're doing right now. Spurs, they got uh, beat 2-1. Was it at Anfield or was it at the Tottenham Spurs Stadium? Don't know. Uh, yeah, No Heart Lane or whatever it's called, the new, the, uh, the new stadium. No Point Lane. <laughs> yes. Um, so they got beat there as well. Man United, they got stuffed 3-1 off a new Aston Villa looking side with Unai Emery taking his first game there. And it, Brighton... Yeah, Brighton, they uh, had a good little win as well. So that makes up the top six. Looking out to that top six, you've got Liverpool, you've got Chelsea. They're all knocking on the door. But it's little old Newcastle sat in third place. And tell me how good that feels, boys. I'll start with you first, Jimmy. Just before we get into that, we've got uh, some breaking news, uh, Craig. So... Uh... I- our good friend Keg has just posted in our uh, in our group chat that Ralph uh, Hazard Hortel has parted company with the club, so uh, he is uh, no longer manager of the club. And sadly, from my perspective and Keg's perspective, uh, ex Melbourne Victory great Richard Kitchbigler has also left, so that's quite disappointing. But uh, but yeah, so he has gone. So good riddance to uh, Ralph. But um, in ter- in terms of the league table, I mean, look at that; it's just out of this world. I mean, if you said to us at the start of the season, that going into the World Cup break, we're going to be entrenched in the top four, <laughs> you would have thought you are you are cuckoo. You are got, you've got no idea. So the fact that we're there and we've lost one game out of 14, we've got a goal difference of plus 17. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I, I don't know I don't know how to describe it in words, but I mean, we're, we're playing Chelsea this week. We'll, we'll, we'll have a preview about that later in the week, but... We're playing Chelsea this week. We're already six points clear of them. We, we beat them before before this break. We're going to be nine points clear in the top six. It's uh, it's out of control. Now, Bobby, we all have wild dreams. We all have aspirations for our football club. But when that first whistle went against uh, Nottingham Forest for the opening game of the season, did you think 14 games later would be sat third on 27 points with a plus 17 goal difference? Absolutely not. <laughs> No, absolutely not. <laughs> I thought we'd have a, a year where we wouldn't worry about relegation. And that was my only concern. I thought I thought this year would be stabilising because Howe would want to bring his own systems in and tactics and and way of things. He'd want to change what he, what he had at the end of last season. Um, but what he's achieved in such a short period of time is just absolutely remarkable. And no, I don't, and anyone who thought they, we would be third with a goal difference of 17 is kidding themselves. So, um, yeah, it's keeping me awake at the moment. Like, it's the only thing, you know, driving me on at the moment just to see Newcastle third. It's where we should be. Um, I'm glad we're back. Yeah, absolutely. Now, speaking of getting back, this is something I was actually speaking to a lot on Twitter about. And just a question this one. All the entertainers back. Is this the entertainers 
2.0. Can we begin to dream yet? Or is this a case of we're getting too far ahead of ourselves and we need to take a step back and a deep breath? Are we allowed to dream? I'll start with you first on this one, Demi. Oh, we definitely can dream. I mean, that's that's the the beauty of this takeover and, and where we are now with how we can we can now dream again about challenging for for things and not just ticking along like old Stevie used to say. We're actually doing something and trying to progress ourselves as a club. So we can definitely dream. Whether we're the entertainers, I I'd, I'd like to think we're potentially a, a better version of that. Where obviously that team was was fantastic. There was wonderful players individually in that team, but I'd hazard a guess that I'd, I'd hazard a guess that um, there hasn't been a turnaround like we've seen with Joe Linton or Miggy Armour on back then, and just any plays that Howe is getting his hands on, he, he's making a better player. So I, I, I think that we can become better than that, and and obviously with as the years go on, we'll have, we'll make more additions and, and better players will come in, and and hopefully we'll be in that top spot, not not in third, but but yeah, definitely we can dream again. That's uh, no doubt about that. Well. Oh. Bobby, uh, you're a similar age to myself. Uh, we're not quite as much of a spring chicken as Dim is. We're old enough to remember the entertainers, what they were and the games that were being played at the time without having to rely on YouTube or DVDs or anything like that. How does this side now compare to the entertainers that you remember? Oh, geez. It's, it's a different, different feel, I think. This is a more... How do I say it? Like, I think Dibby made a bold claim there that said we're a better version of the entertainers. Yeah. I think, we will I be. We will be. I hope, our, I hope be. our comment box goes nuts after that. But, we will be a better version. Um, I, you know what? I'm going to agree with him. I think we're a better total football team now. I think defensively, we are much better than that entertainers team. And I, I don't think we can deny that. Um, and attackingly, we surprisingly are as good. I, I, I'm just about. So, um, that team made me fall in love with the club uh, and this team has renewed my love with the club back again. So a lot of similarities in that way, but I think there are, they're different setups as well. So, and, and Keegan and um, how are different characters. And I think they sort of mold what they were like Keegan was your extravagant, you know, manager that, you know, was larger than life and that team was larger than life, you know, whereas this team is very how and it's calm and it's process driven and, you know, and I think that's what this team is. So that, you know, they sort of echo their managers at the time, but um, I do love this team. Um, I'm falling, falling really rapidly in love with this team. So if you are of a certain vintage and you can remember that entertainer's uh, team quite well, or if you want to maybe compare the current team to maybe the Sir Bobby Robson era, let us know in the comments down below of what you think how this current team compares to those two from previous generations. Really interested to get everyone's opinion on that one. Personally, I think we are a step behind from where we were for the entertainers, maybe two steps, probably on par with where Sir Bobby was. But like uh, Dimmy said, we have the resources now to overtake where the entertainers were at some point. And that may come sooner than what we all thought initially, to be honest, because this season is a roller coaster and we are currently on the high, uh, ready to rise to the top. Um, just to go just on, before, can, on, can we can we dream? If Leicester can win the title, we can make Europe. That's a very valid point. So, yeah, I mean, I was thinking top 10 finish would be good, but I'm definitely thinking that we're good enough and we're well managed enough to, to finish top four. So let's dream. Let's absolutely let's dream. And dreams don't come much bigger than those of us on time today because we've been dreaming for such a long time for days like this to come back. And just before we end this uh, review of the Southampton game, I'm just going to get a uh, man of the match. And I'm going to come to you first on this one, Bobby. This is quite a tough one because there was no real standout performer. Uh, but I'll let you go first. I was having to think of this um, this afternoon and it's a tough one. Uh, it's either Willock or Trippier for me. Um, I'm going to give it to Trippier. I think, yeah, I'll give it to Trippier. Um, uh, Demi? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking along the same lines as Bobby, but I'm going to give it to Willock. I think... 
the goal topped off what he's been doing the last couple of months and he's all action, all energy display in the middle of the park. I think uh, I think he deserves a BOG today. And uh, Myself, and I'm going to go for, and this is because he had such a cracking game, he ran pretty much all over the park, and the only thing he didn't do was score, and that was Sean Longstaff. Uh, he had a cracking game, like I said, he had that chance to score in the first half to put with 2-0 up. If that had went in, I think he would have been everyone's man of the match, to be honest. Um, it would have been thoroughly deserved. But yeah, that's the first time I think I've ever gave uh, Sean Longstaff man of the match. And that just shows how much he has progressed under how he's been well and truly held. And let's see who gets uh, the next treatment. It looks like it's going to be Jacob Murphy. But that is the... <laughs> If it is Jacob Murphy, then, you know, I will literally eat my feet because I've been very critical of that fella over the past couple of uh, months. And if anybody can improve him, it's going to be Eddie Howe. Um, but I think uh, we'll leave it at that. That'll do for uh, the review of the Southampton game. Another massive win for Eddie in the mags. Uh, Eddie in his Champions League Christmas mags as well. How good does that sound? <laughs> crazy. Ridiculous. Absolutely, Absolutely crazy. Ridiculous. It absolutely is. Um, but now we're going to move on to a, a quick preview of the Crystal Palace Carabao Cup game, which is a quarter at eight night time kickoff on Wednesday in the UK. It's in James's Park. This is a third round tie, I believe it is. And we played Palace a few times uh, across the FA Cup and the League Cup. And we obviously played them this season in the league as well when we had that goal randomly disallowed by VAR for that push on Willock, which should have been a penalty or a goal. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll gloss over that. We'll forget about that uh, just for the moment. Now, being a cup game, we've no idea how the, the sides are going to line up. We've had a, our best guess. Uh, both Bobby and Dimmy have uh, uh, put their heads together and come up what they think is going to be our predicted start in 11 for that game. I'll let you run through this 11, Dimmy. Yep, so we've got we've uh, kept Pope in goal. I think there's a there's a chance obviously Darlow might come back now. He's back fit. He may come in, but we've we've said Darlow in goal. Target I think needs a game. He's he's going to come in at left back. Botman center back. Begrudgingly, my man Jamal Sells will, will come in for this game. I think he uh, he probably needs a run. So he'll he'll come in and probably wear the captain's armband because I think there's no point playing Trippier in this game, especially with him feeling his hammy this morning. I yeah. think he needs a rest. So Mankilo comes in. In the middle, we've got Joe Linton back from suspension. He probably needs needs another game. I think John Joe Show is potentially due a start. I think uh, he'd, he'd do well in the middle. And I've gone with Alec Anderson as well in the middle with ASM. Again, another one who hasn't started a game for a while out on the left. Chris Wood up front and Jacob Murphy out on the right. Yeah, so you obviously both come together to collaborate with uh, that starting eleven. Uh, we've no idea how Palace are going to line up. They're not actually doing too bad in the league right now. They just beat West Ham with a literally a last second deflected goal, I believe it was, uh, down at uh, the London Stadium. So they're sitting comfortably mid table. I think they're tenth right now, just behind Liverpool. There, thereabouts. So they've got a little bit of pressure off them. So they may feel a, a stronger team, and then you know. We could have a, a good cup run this year ourselves. In Palace, there won't be any pushovers. They've got some quality players in there. And Vieira has them all singing on uh, the same hymn sheet on that one. Just going to get a predicted scoreline off you both before we do finally wrap this one up. But if that is the starting lineup that we've got, got that we uh, going to go with on that one, Botman playing the will it be his fourth game in two weeks or something like that. There or thereabouts. Uh, would he not be a little bit concerned over his overall fitness? Or do you think the fact he's only 22, he should be able to play two games a week with ease? I'll come to you first on that one, Bobby. Um, yeah, I think if he was playing, you know, in Europe, he'd be doing it. So um, it was either him or Dan Byrne in that position. So I think, yeah, we just went with Botman um, next to LaSalle's and see how that goes. I think he's capable. I don't think... He's had any injury qualms, and he looked pretty fit at the end of the game, even despite the weather conditions at Southampton. So, um, yeah, I think he should be fine. And the only other thing, that right-hand side uh, with uh, Wilfred Zahar may or may not get a start, might not even get any minutes at all. That right-hand side for us looks a little bit weak defensively, especially with uh, Mankiw not having much game time recently. Yeah, could leave that side a little bit vulnerable. And... 
Do you think maybe somebody the likes of Fraser, who may offer a bit more defensive capability, could potentially get the start ahead? Potentially. I think um, if Fraser starts, I think it'll be for ASM and, and they won't want to rush. They want to rush ASM back into a starting lineup. Maybe ASM will start against Chelsea on the weekend, but I think that I think that yeah, Fraser Fraser does give us a bit more cover potentially defensively, and and you're right, Zaha running at Mankilo, especially if Lascelles is there as well, is probably not a strong right side of the, it's not a strong right side of defence. So it, it it is a potential worry, but I think um, I'm past the point of worrying about other teams now. I think with Eddie Howe and with this team, I think you just feel confident with how we're going to perform, no matter who, even even though my mate is going to be playing this game most likely. No matter who plays, you've got to be confident that Howe's going to get the team playing the right way. So, uh, yeah, whoever it is, I think um, we, we need to be confident that they'll, they'll do the job. So, the game is a sellout at St. James's Park. There is no live, you, no live TV coverage here in Australia as of yet. That could change. Or if I manage to get access to a VPN, uh, I will be watching the, the game live. And we will be doing our review of that game uh, tied with a preview of the Chelsea game, which is then going to bring the, the season to its mid-break because of the stupid timing of the 2022 World Cup. And just quick thoughts on that one, lads. And I think we all agree with this one. I'll come to you first on this one, Bobby. This break could come at a pretty bad time for us, given the momentum we're on right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think I said in the last pot I was on that um, what could damage our season? It's this break. It could be something that just takes the wind out of our sails. But in saying that, I think Eddie's probably had a plan in place from the start of the season for this. And... Um, what to do with the players and our sports science team have shown that they're um, up there with the best. So I think we should be okay. Um, dependent on players going to the world cup and getting injured and, and all that sort of thing. But I think um, Eddie will have a plan. I'm not too worried. I mean, everyone's got to go through it. So we're no different um, yeah. to anyone else. So I think we, we more than anyone else, will be best prepared for it because of Eddie, Eddie Howe. So yeah, see how it goes. Uh, you're on the same board on that one, Demi. I'd imagine you don't want this break to come. Uh, yes and no. I'm probably slightly different. I'm, I'm probably more more happy that we're going to get a rest, to, to be honest, because I think the, the amount of work that the boys have put in and there hasn't been much squad rotation, I think the rest won't, won't do us any harm. We're not going to have too many players at the World Cup, so most of our players will be able to rest. And, and like Bobby said, with with a mini training camp or whatever Howe's going to do with the, with the guys, I think we can trust that their fitness base is going to be kept at a supreme level. So, so yeah, it, obviously annoying that we're, we're on this great run and we're going to have to stop the season, but with Howe in charge, there's uh, nothing to worry about. Totally agree. In Eddie, we trust. And I don't think we've felt what maybe this way about a manager since, what, uh, maybe Chris Hutton or even Bobby Robson, you know? Uh, Chris Hutton, he's got a lot of respect amongst the fan base, and rightly so. Sir Bobby before him, then Keegan, those are probably the three top managers we've had at the club since our Premier League. I'm not going to include Pardew on that one because he had that one season, and then the rest he was dog shit with. Um, but yeah, Eddie is definitely up there. He's definitely going to be a future trophy winning manager for Newcastle United. Nice stick, a claim on that one, and I think everybody else would do exactly the same as well. Uh, but that's going to end the pod there. Just got one last little request. Score for the cup game. And I'll come to you first on this one, Dimmy. 2-1 win with uh, Jamal Lascelles own goal. But uh, <laughs> a winner a winner by Joe Linton in the 78th minute. And yours, Bobby? <laughs> uh, my prediction is Eddie Howe's going to turn Lascelles into a brick wall. But... Um... <laughs> No, um, I, I had 2-1 as well, funny enough. So I'll, I'll stick with 2-1 because Nostra Dimi over there predicted it too. So, yeah, 2-1. I'm going to go Newcastle to win it on penalties. Yeah. Wouldn't surprise Yeah. We don't do very well on penalties, but, you know, we uh, I'd imagine we'll be practising beforehand because the game has to end on the night as well. There's no second-round replays anymore. Uh, so a game has to go through. Penalties at the Gallagher end with a crowd behind. I'd imagine we would be uh, 
pretty good at that. But that's going to wrap up this podcast for today. Thanks to Dimmy. Thanks to Bobby for joining us. And what has been another superb weekend in terms of results for us and games around us. Eddie in his mighty marks is sat third in the table. We will be Champions League place for Christmas. And it doesn't really get much better than that, does it, boys? Any final words from yourselves? I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say I'll join you, but obviously not in that aspect. I'm going to kick myself. I'm absolutely shattered. And imagine, uh, Dimmy, you're exactly the same. You've been running on fumes since about nine o'clock this morning on your Greek coffee, I think you said? Yep. Had my uh, had my foot up at about three o'clock, so that's kept me going for this pod. But, uh, yeah, I can feel the crash happening. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, uh, it's about to happen to me as well. But thanks to everybody who's been listening. Thanks to everybody who's been watching. Uh, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, hit those five-star reviews on the audio platforms. Leave us a comment down below on what you thought of this pod and any questions you may have. Also, with the break in the World Cup as well, uh, we are going to be doing some special podcasts. And we just like to know from any of our followers out there, if there's any type of content you would like us to see, any content you'd like us to do during the World Cup. Uh, we love interacting with our fans and our subscribers. So please hit us up with anything that you think uh, you would like to see. Be more than happy to say those in the comments. But thanks to everyone. Again, thanks to Dimmy. Thanks to Bobby. Have a cracking night. Enjoy your kit. And we will see you on the next one, which will probably be Thursday night for us, I believe. Yep. yep. So That's thanks, good. everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the week. And we will see you on the next one. Cheers, lads. Yeah, lads. Thanks, mate.